I would like to introduce this message by asking you to turn to Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. Now some, let's see, 60 to 35, 56 years ago, a group by the name of the birds sang this song entitled Turn, Turn, and they quoted Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Probably most of you, if not all of you, have heard that song, and do you know it reached number one in the United States? It was a top-selling song. And I've asked myself the question, why? This is a scripture, since when does a scripture make the top-selling song? Well, I believe the answer is, is this passage of scripture is looked upon by the world as a philosophy of life. Things happen. Good things, bad things, they happen and they'll pass and it's all happening for a reason, some kind of vague philosophy that everybody can find some kind of comfort in. Yeah, there is a time to live, and there is a time to die, and there is a time to gather up stones, there is a time to cast away stones, and it's just kind of a vague philosophical view of life that makes me feel better about the way things are, and it is founded on a complete misunderstanding of this passage of Scripture. Now, let me say this. This passage of scripture is not a philosophy of life. It's a prophecy regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Now read it in that light. Sure, there are a lot of good things we can draw from it, but more than anything else, this is a prophecy with regard to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he talks about purpose. God's got one purpose, the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, and everything that happens comes out of that one single purpose. Now let's read this passage of Scripture, and you look at this in light of the Lord. To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down. A time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. Now when our Lord Jesus left eternity and entered time, all of these things took place in his great work. And I want to call your attention to verse 7, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Now we have that prophecy fulfilled in the passage of scripture we just read about when the Lord kept silence and when the Lord spake. Now turn with me back to Mark chapter 14, if you would. Verse 53, And they led Jesus away to the high priest. 
Now, I think it's kind of ironic that these same people that led him away had just been knocked backwards. You remember when they came to arrest him? And he said, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And they were driven backwards by irresistible omnipotence. And they were made to see that this is the Almighty One. This is God. This is the one who's in control. He's no victim at this time. And I wonder how they felt while they were binding him up. They bound his hands. And they led him to the high priest. You know, Isaiah 53, 7 says he'll be led as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. He'll be led. Well, he's being led at this time to the high priest. Now, the high priest at that time was an utterly corrupt man in a position of power. We can find that all over the place, can't we? An utterly corrupt man in a position of power. As a matter of fact, there were two high priests at this time, and this lets us know this was a political position. If they had any understanding of the high priest, there would have never been two high priests. So this was a political position. This was a corrupt man but he was put in this position by God for this time. The Lord controls all things. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. What a group. Verse 54, And Peter followed him afar off, even unto the palace of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire, and the chief priests and all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. That's what they wanted. That's what they wanted. They wanted to put him to death. These religious leaders wanted to put him to death. They hated Jesus Christ. And my dear friend, this is such a humbling thought. You and I were born into this world with the same nature they had. With a hatred of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, so I've never hated Christ. Well, you didn't hate the Christ you made up, but the Christ of the Bible, the natural man hates. And these men wanted to see to it that he was put to death. That was their goal. That was their end in what was taking place. And they sought witnesses against the Lord, but found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. Now, a false witness, a false prophet, will always have a contradictory message that doesn't agree with Scripture. Every time. Verse 57, And there arose certain and bare false witness against him, saying, We heard him say. And they're going to go back to three years ago when the Lord began his public ministry. Would you turn to John 2 for just a moment? Verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? What gives you the authority to make a whip and whip people and drive them out of the temple? Give us a sign. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple in three days, and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> then said the Jews, 46 years was the temple and building. What thou reared up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Now, they misquoted that. And look what they said, verse 58. We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple that's made with hands, and within three days I'll build another made without hands. He didn't say that, did he? They changed what he said, be it ever so slight, they changed what he said. But neither did their witnesses agree together. It's always that way. Verse 60, and the high priest, this corrupt man, stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it? which these witness against thee. Aren't you going to try to defend yourself? Are you answering nothing? And he held 
is peace. Just as Isaiah said, he would hold his peace. Isaiah 53, 7 says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He brought as a lamb to the slaughter and sheep before her shears is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. And how majestic is the king in his silence. How powerful is the roar of his silence. Now let me give you seven reasons why the Lord kept silent at this time. Now I know this. If I'm accused of something that I didn't do, I'm going to try to defend myself. I'm not going to just keep my mouth shut. I know I will. I'll try to do it. If I didn't do it and you accuse me of it, I'm going to try to defend myself. But the Lord doesn't. He keeps silent with all these accusations. And let me give you these seven reasons real quickly. First of all, he kept silent that the scripture might be fulfilled. Isaiah 53, 7 says he would keep silent. And that's exactly what he did. Secondly, he kept silent because he's letting us know his utter willingness to go through all of this. Everything he's doing, he's doing in a completely willing way. He could have defended himself, but he knew the purpose behind this. And he was completely willing to, to do this. His hour had come and he was willing. He's letting us know that. Whatever it was he was doing, he was willing to do it. Thirdly, he did not speak to these men because he was not pleased to make himself known to them. That's a sobering thought. But if he doesn't speak to us, we'll never hear his voice. We will not be saved if he doesn't speak to us. The fourth reason he remained silent because, is because of his complete submission to his Father's will. He said, the cup which my Father hath given me to drink, shall I not drink it? Now he had said earlier, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Who knows what all is in that? I know that he knew as God that it wasn't possible, but the thought of being made sin in the flesh, he was overcome with. He said, if it be possible, this thing of being forsaken of God, being cut off from God, losing the Father's smile, losing the Father's expect acceptance, knowing he was going to bear all that hell is, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But it wasn't possible. He knew that. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And then he said to his disciples, The cup which my Father hath given me to drink, shall I not drink it? Why did he remain silent? And if you haven't heard anything else, hear this. Because he's guilty. Because he was guilty. Now, I've already touched on this. If I'm not guilty of what I'm accused of, you can be sure I'm going to speak of my defense. The Lord remains silent. Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says, We know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world stand guilty before God. At this time, his mouth, was stopped. When he drank that cup, he became guilty of the commission of the sins of his people. Somebody says he bore the wrath. More than that, he bore the reason for the wrath. He bore the guilt. He bore the sin itself. And he became guilty of the commission of that sin. Now he never personally committed a sin, but on the cross 
It was not the innocent being punished. It was the guilty being punished. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, his death was a substitutionary death. And all he died for must be set free. Now listen to this real carefully. If he can die for your sins, and you're punished anyway for those same sins that he died for, his death is meaningless. It's utterly meaningless. It's without power. It's without efficacy. If he can die for you, and you end up being damned anyway, his death is utterly without meaning. And salvation is by works. Now that's how serious this thing is. 99%, and I don't think I'm overstating that, 99% of what goes on under the name of Christianity says that Jesus Christ died for everybody and made everybody's salvation available. But it's up to what you do as to whether or not it'll work for you. There's no gospel in that message at all. It's a false message. What he was doing, he was doing as a substitute. He was guilty. And the scripture says he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Not frustrated. Not disappointed that his will is not being done. Well, I intended for this to happen and it didn't take place. No, he'll see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That is why he was silent. Guilty. Guilty before the law of God. And he held his peace. Listen to this. He held his peace out of love for his bride. You see, if he didn't hold his peace, I mean, you're in big trouble, aren't we? But he held his peace out of the love he had for his bride. Isn't his silence powerful? So much is said by his silence. And there is a time to keep silence. And this is that time. But not only is there a time to remain silent, there is a time to speak. And there was a time for the Lord to speak during this time. I, let me read a passage from John chapter 19, if you want to turn over there. This is before Pilate. We're going to consider this in more detail in a couple of weeks. But we read where the Jews, the chief priests, said to Pilate, Verse 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Now you know what that means? That means Pilate was freaked out at this time. What am I getting into? Who is this? What's happening to me? He was freaked out. He was afraid. He, he was afraid of the Lord in a, in a human way. He had a great respect for him. He, he could see that these people had delivered him for envy. He was a savvy politician. He knew what was going on, but he couldn't give an explanation for this man before him. So look what he says. When verse 8, when Pilate therefore heard that, that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went in again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. He was silent before Pilate. He was silent before Herod. And they were going to bring him back to before Pilate. And he was going to be silent again. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? You know, the Lord had to respond to this. <laughs> 
he had to respond to this. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Now what our Lord is saying to Pilate, this is my will being done. You are my pawn performing my will. I am in control of every event. While we're here, look over in John chapter 18. John gives this detail with regard to the Lord's speech that no one else did in the Gospels. Verse 19, the high priest, John 18 verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. You're asking about my doctrine? I never said anything in secret. Everything I said was out in the open. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I've said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. Now what a man believes is what he preaches publicly. It's what he confesses publicly. You know, I uh, ran into somebody that used to attend this church that they're now attending a church where the gospel's not preached. And I was talking to them and I said, do they uh, believe that God elected the people the church are going to now? And the person answered, well, I don't know. I've never heard them say anything about it. And, well, that pretty much answers that question, doesn't it? Uh, if you hear a man preach a gospel, you're going to know whether or not he believes election right off the bat. You, you just will because that's who God is. That's how he saves. But this is the way the Lord spake, and this is the way every true preacher speaks. He didn't say anything in secret. He says publicly what he believes. And he said, don't ask me, ask them that heard me. They're the one who heard me, and they can tell what I preached. Well, back to Mark chapter 14. Verse 60, And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him. And notice the question this time. It's a different question. The high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Did he keep silence? And Jesus said, I am. No mistake about that, is there? I am. I am the Christ. I am the Son of the Blessed. Now, he'd already told them this before. Matthew's account says, are you the Son of God? I love the way he said, it, thou sayest which means it is as you said. I am the Son of God. In John chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, and this was earlier in his public ministry, he said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. In other words, my work and his work are one. We're one and the same. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. If you believe not that I am, you'll die in your sins, he said. I am God. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? It's now time to speak. I am equal. I am equal with God for this one singular reason. I am God.
Earlier he had said to his disciples, he that has seen me, what? Hath seen the Father. I'm the creator. I'm in control of all this. He'd already demonstrated this at his arrest when he knocked them backwards when they came to get him to let him know I'm not a victim. I'm, you're my pawns doing my will and I'm in control of all this. Are you going to take it that far? Yes, I'm going to take it that far. He was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. And everything was done, was done according to God's purpose and according to God's will. Everything, everything was done by the will of Christ. Everything. I'm not taking that too far. Because I am, look what he says, I am, verse 62, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, because I am, you're going to see me sitting, not standing, but sitting, on the right hand of power. Now, he's speaking of the authority of his omnipotence. You're going to see me sitting. At the right hand of power. You know, I love that scripture, power belongeth to the Lord. I don't know of anything that annoys me more than somebody calling some son of Adam or daughter of Adam a powerful person. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Oh, the place of power. You know, when Daniel said, he doeth according to his will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that does his will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And not only is he the sovereign, he's the sitting sovereign. Now there's great significance to that. He is the sitting sovereign. You're in Mark, look at Mark chapter 16, verse 19. So after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven. And what did he do? He sat down. He sat down on the right hand of God. Now this sitting has to do with him finishing his work. When he had by himself purged our sins, made them not to be, put them away, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. The work of purging was done. The writer to the Hebrews said, Every high priest standeth, standeth daily, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for, by one offering he hath perfected. That's talking about you if you're a believer. He hath perfected. Not he will perfect, he hath perfected forever them which are Sanctified, the sitting sovereign Savior, his work being completed. There's nothing left for him to do. You remember his last words. It's finished. His great high priestly prayer for his people, speaking to his father. He said, I've glorified thee on the earth. I've finished the work thou gavest me to do. Oh, the high priest said, are you the son of bless the blessed? The Christ, I am. And after this, you're going to see the Son of Man 
I love the way he calls himself the Son of Man. You know, that's the title he gave to himself more than any other title. The Son of Man. You're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. And look what it says next. And coming in the clouds of heaven. Now he does not only speak about his sitting, but he speaks of his coming. His second coming return. You'll see me coming in the clouds of heaven as speaking of his second advent. He said in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Don't you long for that sight? When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And then we read of that great division that will take place when he separates the nations into two groups, the sheep and the goats. And he'll say to the sheep, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he'll say to the goats, Depart, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, when we talk about his return, you say, well, there's so much that you, holes left and there's so much we don't know. We have certain statements, but I know this. I know this. The thief on the cross understood his return. He might not have understood all the mechanics behind it, but he said this, Lord. You see, here's the key. He knew who he was. This is everything. This is Knowing who he is is everything. It's going to determine everything else. The thief knew who he was. Lord! Oh, he knew he was the Lord. Remember me when you come and return into your kingdom. You're not going to stay dead. I know who you are. It's impossible for you to fail. You're going to come back as a mighty reigning king. You believe that? You believe what the thief did? You're going to come back. Nothing's going to stop you. You're going to come back as a mighty reigning king. Oh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. If you simply mention my worthless name, all is well. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Well, here's what the high priest thought about all this. Verse 63. Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him and cover his face and to buffet him and say unto him, Prophesy! And, thy servant, and the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. The king's silence and the king's speech. The king's silence tells us the nature of what he was doing. He was silent because he took my sin and my sorrow and he made it his very own. And he was silent because he really was guilty. This isn't play acting. This isn't pretend. He stood guilty before God. His mouth was stopped. Oh, how loud his silence is. And how glorious his word is. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? I am. I am. And after this, you're going to see me sitting down at the right hand of power. And then I'm going to come back in the clouds to receive my people unto myself. The king's silence and the king's speech. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for the excellency and the glory of our Redeemer. How we thank you for his silence. 
in taking our guilt and making it his own and standing guilty before you, his mouth was stopped. And Lord, our hearts shrink up in thinking of the greatness of what took place and how we love what he said how we love his I am's because he is the great I am. How we thank you for his power and how we thank you that he sat down at the right hand of power, having completed his work. And how we thank you for his return. And Lord, our, our hearts cry as even so come, Lord Jesus. Bless this message for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.